Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, now we're all back for program number four this afternoon. And uh, again, for those of you on television, again, we just want to thank you and praise you for your letters, your financial help, your prayers. And uh, again, we just want to make one brief announcement that we still have the one book. Now, I don't push it, but uh, we do want to let people know that it is available. And uh, if you want a copy or 11 bucks, I guess I can put it on the air, can I? We've had it that price for a long time, so we'll just keep it there. And then uh, just write, call, and we'll get it out to you. Okay, time goes so fast this afternoon for some reason or other. I don't know why, but... <laughs> We better get right back into the book where we left off in the last program where we were in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, yeah, Colossians 1, down at verse 24. <clears throat> and uh, we had to digress and remind people of what Paul was talking about, how he spoke of being afflicted for the body's sake, which is the church. And again, I'm going to repeat it, repeat it, and repeat it. Only... Paul uses the term, the body of Christ. You'll never find it anywhere else in Scripture. And consequently then, the body of Christ is a result of these mysteries that were revealed to this apostle after the Lord commissioned him and that Damascus Road experience. <clears throat> so always be aware of this, that uh, when people start arguing about things that are in the four Gospels compared to what Paul says that only Paul deals with things that pertain to us. Now I'll just give you an example. You cannot find anywhere else in Scripture that we're saved by faith and faith alone in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You cannot find it until you get to Paul. And uh, a lot of other things, like what we've just been talking, how that Christ was the very creator of everything. Well, you won't find that anywhere else in Scripture, like we saw it here in Colossians in our last program. All right, so let's come back again, if you will, to Paul's revelation of this mystery now concerning the body of Christ. <clears throat> Verse 24 again who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Now remember who he's talking to, Gentile believers there in western Turkey in the little city of Colossae just to the north east of Ephesus. All right, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. That's why we went back to 2 Corinthians in the last program to show how he suffered throughout his whole 20-some years of ministry, over and over and over, and all for the sake of the body, which is the church. All right, now then, coming on down to verse 25, whereof I am made a minister. Now, again, I like to qualify and define words. What does he mean by a minister? Well, he was the sent one. That's basically what an apostle meant. But he was a divinely sent individual that God was going to use for his own distinct purposes, and in this case, amongst the Gentiles. Now, let me just, by sake of comparison, Scripture with Scripture, come back with me to Romans chapter 15, and we find the same word now used in relation with Christ himself. <coughs> but a totally different ministry. Romans chapter 15, verse 8. Romans 15, verse 8. And here's another verse that most of Christendom doesn't want to touch with a 10-foot pole because of what it says. All right, look at it. Romans 15, verse 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was, past tense, a minister, see, there's the word, a sent one. Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. Who's the circumcision? Israel. See? So Jesus Christ was a sent one, a minister, not 
for the whole human race per se, but he came unto his own, and his own received him not. See? All right, now Paul is just rehearsing that very same fact that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. And the circumcision plus nothing, see? For the truth of God. It wasn't something that Paul dreamed up. This is the way God ordained it, that coming out of the Old Testament promises and prophecies concerning Israel, they were to have a Messiah, a Redeemer, a King, and a Kingdom. And so he was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right, Paul is reminding us this. So I say then again that Jesus Christ was, in his past, his earthly ministry, a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm, to bring to fruition the promises made to the fathers. Well, basically, what were those promises? I've already mentioned a coming Messiah, Redeemer, and King, and a kingdom. But Israel rejected it, and they crucified him. And brought about, of course, as Romans 11 teaches so explicitly, that through their rejection, they brought the plan of salvation to us of the Gentile world. All right, but now come back to Colossians. Now we see that Paul is a minister, but of a whole different sort and to a different criteria. He is not a minister of Israel. He is a minister of of the Gentiles in particular, and of course, we're not going to leave the Jewish people out of this now. <clears throat> so now, verse 25, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which in other places is called the dispensation of grace, remember? Same dispensation, same period of time during which the directions are still the same. So he's made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. All right, now I know we just did this a couple programs back, but keep your hand in Colossians and turn back to Ephesians 3. We got to keep comparing Scripture with Scripture so that we know what he's talking about. Now back to Ephesians 3, verse 2, and compare that with what he just says in Colossians. In Colossians, he calls it the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you Gentiles. Now in Ephesians 3, verse 2, he says, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. The same thing, but two different terminologies. But the grace of God, which is given to me, to you word. And then Christendom keeps turning their back on this man when he alone was given the marching orders for this age of grace. And they can't get it. They just can't get it. That's why I put the, the statement from uh, Lewis Berry Chafer on the program a while back. He said the same thing. That what a difference between what Christ and the Twelve and John the Baptist preached for Israel compared to what Paul preaches to the Gentile world. Jesus and the Twelve knew nothing of Paul's gospel of the grace of God. All they understood who he was. He had come to fulfill the Old Testament promises. Paul now doesn't refer to the Old Testament promises. He's talking about a whole new ballgame for us. We're not looking for an earthly kingdom. We're looking for what? Heavenly. What a difference. But you see, God is still going to, after he's finished this uh, body of Christ and takes it out of the way, and we'll look at that in our next taping session, but we're not looking for an earthly kingdom and a king. We're looking for that which pertains to the heavenlies. Totally different. But oh, they can't seem to get it. All right, here we go. Now verse, oh, let's see. I've got to get back to Colossians. Chapter 1. Verse 25, finishing the verse. This dispensation of God which is given to me for you, that is for you Gentiles, remember now he's writing to Colossi believers, but it was for the whole Gentile body of Christ. And what's the end result? To fulfill or bring to fruition or bring to completion, to bring to a finish the word of God. In other words, the New Testament would finally 
be completed. Now that brings up another thought. And people don't stop to think about it. How many years did these early believers of the Apostle Paul, how many years did they have to go with no Pauline instructions in the printed page? A long time, see? He probably began his ministry about 40. I say about, it can't be real dogmatic, but he began his ministry up in uh, Tarsus and then down to Antioch about 40 A.D., well, my heavens, when did he write his first epistle? Huh? Yeah, in the 50s. So you got at least 15 or more years that those early believers did not have these kind of instructions. So how do you suppose they got it? Verbally, see? All right, now then. Well, that's chasing rabbits again, isn't it? Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And see, most people, I don't think, even get an inkling of what he's talking about. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. 1 Corinthians, chapter 14, verse 1. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, plural, but rather that you may prophesy. Now think a minute. Out of all the spiritual gifts that the Corinthians were concerned about, which one was to be paramount above everything else? Well, the gift of prophesying. But now here's the kicker. When you think of prophesying, what does the normal individual think of? Telling the future, like Isaiah and, and the old past. No, this word prophesy means speaking forth. See? Just simply speaking forth the word of God. So what's Paul implying here? The most important gift that a believer could have in those days before they had the written scripture was the God-given gift to preach the word. See? That's all they had, gifted men, until the scripture came in. Now, I guess I should have stayed and gone back to 1 Corinthians 13. Been a long time since we taught Corinthians, except I guess the daily programs will be getting it pretty soon. But see, now in chapter 13, between 12 and 14, the chapters on gifts, chapter 13, verse 8. And now maybe this will give you a little free information to go home with today. And for those of you on television, to share with your neighbors. Now maybe this verse will make sense. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. Charity or love never faileth, but where there be prophecies, speaking forth, not telling the future, but where there be men gifted with speaking forth the word, They'll fail. See? They're going to disappear. And where there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish. Why? Because it's coming in the written page. Follow me? Now they'll no longer need gifted men coming in from time to time. They'll have the scriptures in their hands. And that's what we're talking about. All right, and that's what Paul means back here in Colossians now. Come back with me, where he says that it was given to him to fulfill or finish the word of God, his epistles. His epistles. And that completed everything. All right, now we still haven't got to the crux of the mystery, have we? Now verse 26. Even the mystery that is all wrapped up in this dispensation of the grace of God. This whole series of things that had never been revealed before. Seven or eight of them here on the board. All these mysteries now compose the doctrines of the grace age believer. Now all the rest of scripture is certainly the word of God. Don't ever take that away. Don't ever accuse me of saying only Paul is the word of God. No, but you do not get doctrine for Christian living back in the Old Testament. 
You do not get the plan of salvation in the Old Testament and really not in the Gospels. All of it is background. It's all showing us how God has unfolded the plan of the ages, showing us his sovereignty. But when it comes to the nitty gritty of our everyday belief system, you stay between Romans and Philemon and you won't go astray. Now that's all as clear as I can make it. All right, now verse 26. Even the mystery which has been What's the next word? Hid. Now think a minute. How did we start this afternoon? Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things, the hidden things, belong to the Lord our God, and they stay there until he is ready to reveal it. And then here it comes. Now let me show you a good example. I haven't done this in for a long time. Go back to Luke. Chapter 18, beautiful illustration. A beautiful illustration of how God can keep things to himself even though he spoke it. Luke 18, 31, honey. Luke 18, verse 31. The very tail end of his three years of ministry. They're up in northern Israel and they're going to be heading down south up to Jerusalem for the Passover and the crucifixion. You got the setting? Luke 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve, and he said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. Now look what I just said. They're going to be heading south to get to Jerusalem by Passover. <clears throat> we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. All the prophecies concerning his death, burial, and resurrection that we looked at earlier, back in Isaiah 53. We could have looked at Psalms 22 and some others. All right, they're all going to be fulfilled. Now verse 32. Now don't forget, who is he speaking to? The twelve. They're right out there in front of him. All right, so he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, the Romans, and he shall be mocked, spitefully entreated, spitted on. They, the Romans, shall scourge him, put him to death, the crucifixion, and the third day he shall rise again. Did it happen? Every last bit of it. How did he know? He was God. But now look at the next verse. Here are these 12 men, ordinary, healthy 12 men with no hearing problems that we know of. And they, the 12, understood none of these things. And this saying, what I just read from the lips of the Lord Jesus, this saying was what? Hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. In other words, they didn't head down to Jerusalem talking between themselves. Now look, the Lord is going to be arrested by the Romans. The Lord is going to be put to death by the Romans. But on the third day, he's going to... Did that happen? No, they didn't have a clue that anything was going to happen to him. Why? God blinded them from it. He stopped their ears. He kept it hidden. Now, if you don't believe me, just stop and think. If they would have known what he said, and if they would have heard it, where would they have been early that Sunday morning? Outside the tomb, waiting for things to happen. Were they? Oh, they were long gone. It was all over. They had forgotten all about a promise of a king and a kingdom already. He's dead. He's gone. But see what the scripture says? That's what it means when God hides things from mankind, and that's his prerogative. Now, come back again to Colossians. And so this whole concept of this body of Christ called out of the predominantly Gentile world, 
people saved by nothing more than believing that Christ died for them, shed his blood, was buried and rose from the dead, and they become members of the body, and Christ is not their king, he's their head. And it's a living organism. We are in a union with Christ. We are part of a living organism, see? All right. But this whole concept had been totally hidden until it was revealed to this person and no one else. That's why Peter back there that we read earlier this afternoon, that's why he told his readers, you go to Paul because of the wisdom given to him. Peter didn't understand all this. He couldn't. God didn't expect him to. All right, so don't ever lose sight of this. I, 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 I almost get tired of repeating it, but I have to because people can't get it. They just can't get it that this body of Christ is something so insulated from all the prophecies and promises given to Israel that nothing can penetrate it of the Old Testament promise. Now, you see, the reason I get so exercised, I, I don't get any hate mail. Now, I haven't had over two or three letters in 15 years of what I would call a hateful letter. But I do get letters questioning my <laughs> whatever, <laughs> mostly because they cannot see the difference between Christ's earthly ministry and Paul, it's all one jumbled up mess for most people. And then I do, I, I get exercise. Why can't you see when the scripture so clearly separates it all, why do you want to keep mixing it, see? I told Iris, I thought of a good illustration. <laughs> You probably think I'm nuts for sharing it for the whole crowd, but I, I was thinking about a good illustration. And now I know I'm dated. Some of you probably don't even know what I'm going to talk about. But do you remember when the old quart milk bottle was delivered to the door? And before they had dreamed up pasteurizing and homogenizing, we bought raw milk. After 12 hours in that bottle, what happened to that milk? The cream came to the top. And I told Iris, I said, that must be why they formed that bottle the way it did, because the neck would be cream, and down below was that pale blue skimmed milk. All right, and the only reason I'm using that for an illustration, there you have a dividing line between the skim milk below and that cream on top. Now, what do you have to do to mix it? Just tip it upside down. Now, am I making my point? This is what they're doing between these Gospels for Israel and the Gospel of Grace. Here it is, so clearly separated. Here it is, and I told Iris, the best part is, which direction does the cream go? Up! <laughs> Heavenly! Which direction is the rest of it? It's earthly! I thought it was a good illustration. I don't think she thought so. <laughs> But all you have to do to mix it is just turn it upside down a time or two and it loses its identity and once again it's back. That's where Christendom is. They just constantly keep it all amalgamated when God has so perfectly separated it. See, have I made my point? All right, come back to Colossians now then. Even the mystery, this secret which has been hid from ages and generations and now is made manifest, put into the spotlight where there is no doubt about what we're talking about for us saints. Now verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this secret, this mystery, among the what people? Gentiles. Gentiles. Come on, read it. That's what it says. This mystery among the Gentiles. And what is the secret? Christ in you. You see that? That's something that nowhere else in Scripture is that ever alluded to. The Creator Himself indwelling me and you. Are you getting the point? What a revelation! And again, most of Christendom just ignores it. They don't bring this out. You don't see this in Sunday school. You don't hear this on Sunday morning. But what a revelation that here we have 
the Creator God not only purchasing our salvation, not only doing everything that needed to be done on our behalf, then He comes in and above everything else, He becomes part of us and we're part of Him. Oh, what a glorious salvation, see? Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not just for this world. This is just a little passing through. The glory is awaiting us. And we can't even begin to describe it. That's why I think the scripture is silent. It is. You know that there is not one word in here telling us what heaven's going to be like. All the descriptions of heaven are the earthly kingdom to Israel. They're not ours. There is not, see, that's why Paul was not permitted to share what he had seen. We couldn't handle it. But the glory that's awaiting us, beloved, is beyond human understanding. And so don't ever feel that you're selling yourself short by coming apart from the world and living a life that is pleasing in God's sight. Because our glory is ahead of us. It's still coming. All right, verse 28. We've got one minute left. Whom we preach. See, Paul doesn't preach Paul. Paul only knows one gospel. Christ crucified, buried, and risen from the dead. Whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom. Now, like we talked earlier this afternoon, not the wisdom of the intellectual community, but the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, see? that we may present every man mature in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Now, all of this had been kept secret all the way up through the Old Testament, all through the four Gospels, Christ's earthly ministry, not a word about going to the Gentile world. Again, remember, Jesus only dealt with two Gentiles, and they were special dispensations of his compassion. One was the Roman centurion, and the other was the Canaanite woman. Otherwise, it was all Jewish, because all the Old Testament promises were to Israel, not to us. But oh, after his death, burial, and resurrection, out comes this body of truth we call the dispensation of the grace of God, our hope of glory. Watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1 800 369 7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.